Um, yeah, so tonight we're here to just um, give you a bit of an overview about what we've done about safer speed. So we've written a position paper um, and everything I say tonight is available in our position paper, which is on our website. Um, and obviously Dwayne and I are here if you have questions tonight as well. Um, so why did we look at speed? And I think the reason for this is because traffic speed is an integral part of people's walking experience. So part of our vision is to have streets that are safer for everyone, you know, whether it's you going into the office, although maybe not so much these days. Recording in progress. Um, or maybe you taking your kids to school or your kids taking themselves to school, um, just getting to the bus stop, you know. Walking is part of everyday life for a lot of people and traffic speed really can impact on that. Um, and we're also interested in, you may have heard of this concept, 8 to 80. Uh, we're interested, I've heard it put, all ages, all abilities, which I really like. It's, you know, basically making streets available for everyone. So that's that's sort of the background, I guess, to why we've looked at speed. Um, doesn't want to change. There we go. Um, so you've probably all seen graphs like this before. Um, basically, on the vertical axis, it shows the risk of basically being killed if you're walking and hit by a car um, compared to the speed of the vehicle. Um, and th these, this, the different lines are different studies, um, but basically they're all giving you the same sort of story. That the higher speeds are, um, are more dangerous and the exact numbers vary between the studies, but you can see sort of around the 30 to 40 mark, um, the risk increases dramatically and it's not, it's not linear. So, you know, if tra someone travelling at twice the speed isn't twice as dangerous, but they can be four, five, ten times as dangerous to someone walking. Um, and there's heaps, there's heaps of evidence on this, you know, the safety benefits of, of lower speeds. Um, so just a couple here. One is um, in Canada, they, look, they looked at 300 kilometres of local roads um, with a 30k limit and they found a reduction of one-third in crashes and two-thirds of serious injuries and deaths just because of the change of speed limit. Um, and similarly in London, they had they looked at 20 years of data. So, they, you know, they've had this 32 kilometre now speed limit for 20 years and, again, they found this significant reduction in injuries. Um, and we even have our own data now. Like Melbourne, the Melbourne CBD, it's been, it's been 10 years now or nearly 10 years. It was 2012 when we introduced 40 in the HODL grid. Um, and already you can see, you know, the number of crashes for people walking has fallen by over a third. So the, the evidence the evidence is very clear. Lower speeds are safer. Um, what's not so clear and hasn't been as well studied is the other, the other benefits of um, lower speeds. So things like um, amenity and the number of people walking. There's been a couple of studies. So one from Switzerland um, they found that a speed limit of 20 kilometres an hour on their local roads um, resulted in people being two to three times more likely to walk or talk, play, sit and just use the public space. Um, or another one is from the UK where they found that once this 32 kilometre an hour limit was introduced, um, residents really, they really supported it, they really liked it and they reported that it was safer for their kids um, and they were walking more and they were riding more. Um, so there's a little bit of evidence but it hasn't been quite as well um, studied as the safety benefits. Um, the other thing that comes up a bit is the travel time impact. But basically in urban areas, um, travel time is dictated by other vehicles. So it's things like congestion, you know, um, stopping at, at the red light, um, turning, waiting for the person in front of you to turn, um, parking or, you know, trams, buses. There's just a whole lot going on apart from the speed limit that's dictating how fast people move. Um, and the other thing is in Melbourne there are a lot of short vehicle trips. So half of all vehicle trips are less than 4.2 kilometres. So, the, again, the, the travel time has a, a lesser impact because you're travelling at the speed limit for a lesser time. Um, and there was this simulation done of the Melbourne Road Network that found if we reduce the speed limit on all the roads across all of Melbourne except for the freeways, um, travel times would increase by 3% in the short term 
and only like once everything settled down, it would be an increase of about 0.6% um, in travel times. Australia has the highest urban speed limits in the world. So this graph comes from data that the um, International Transport Forum collected. So every year they do an annual report and they look at what's happening in road safety in across 44 countries. Um, so this graph is for residential and arterial roads. So it includes basically all the roads except for the freeways. Um, and you can see there's Australia at the bottom. Basically we have among the highest speed limits in the world. Um, so the lowest we tend to use is around 40, which we use in limited places like, you know, um, school zones or shopping zones up to. We have plenty of arterial roads that you know, 80 kilometres an hour. Um, so a lot of them, if you can see in the middle there, Italy, Germany, France, 50 is the most they use in their urban areas. Um, and this is just the shortlist. Um, so like I mentioned, there are 44 countries. And, like, uh, this this is just a few um, there's heaps, Slovenia, Nigeria, Malaysia, Chile, they all also only have 50 as their maximum urban speed. But there is a bit of momentum for 40. Um, it's been common more, more internationally, like um, particularly in the past in Europe, but also in big cities like New York City in the US or Boston in the US, it's the default speed limit now. Um, in Canada, it's happening across Canada. In Calgary, they just brought in a default 40 kilometres an hour. Um, in Edmonton, this week, I think it is, they're reducing the speed on most residential streets to 40k an hour. Um, Cambodia has a 40 kilometre an hour speed limit. And they're starting to happen here. You guys have probably been involved in um, implementing some of these. It's mostly been the 40 areas have mostly been in the inner suburbs, like, you know, your Yarra, Port Phillip sort of areas, um, but they're starting to extend out, like I understand Darabin are looking to extend all the way out to reservoir, um, 40K areas. So, yeah. Yep, good. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and it's happening a little bit in the middle suburbs. Like um, there's a couple of examples, like I know near me, Oakley, there's, there's an area they've got a 40K um, area so that it's sort of happening and also you might have heard in regional areas like Mildura Mildura have recently brought in 40k for their residential streets so it's happening it's slowly happening but you know here here it's happening um, what I find really interesting is this momentum for 30 um, so it's mostly up till now been sort of city by city basis um, like London have had it for a while Brussels Milan um, Berlin brought it in at, at night as a noise reduction measure to, to limit, I guess, the impact on the residents. Um, Portland in the US have had it for a little while. Toronto and Canada, they've got 30K limits. Um, but the real, the real, I guess, push for this happened at the start of last year. Um, you might have heard of the Stockholm Declaration where part of that's like a big, you know, the country's coming together and... Um, what can we do to make streets safer? And there was a big push as part of that for the 30K urban speed limits, which interestingly um, has coincided with COVID and more people walking and riding. And that's being this, this as, as a result of that, like it's just happening everywhere. Like when I was having a look last week, there's just there's so many places now that are bringing in this 30K an hour speed limit. Um, for example, in Spain and the Netherlands, it's now become their default urban speed limit across the entire country. Um, so rather than just being in cities, it's now spreading, you know, to entire countries. Um, and it's being led by people. It's being led by individuals, by community groups, by NGOs, and it tends to be the politicians follow along, which is what we, we see here in Australia too. <laughs> um, but there's legislation like being brought before um, governments in, in Argentina, in Kenya, like just, just all across the world. I was really, really um, excited, I guess, to see, to see that. And here we're starting to see it a little bit more. So the photo here is from, it's actually from Warrnambool where they've made um, their, their main road 30 kilometres an hour. Um, it's happening you know, in, in the city, we've got Swanson Street, but even outside the city, Fitzroy, um, even out, I believe, in Malacuta. So it's sort of 
there's little pockets happening happening in Australia and in Melbourne. And there's this perception among a lot of people that reducing speed limits is not popular and that it's politically difficult. But people aren't dumb. Like they understand that lower speeds are safer and they broadly support them. Um, so this is two studies that have been done. This is one the Heart Foundation did last year, which found that two-thirds of people will support lower limits in neighbourhood streets. So, you know, think about your street, where you live, and what you want your street to be like. People can, can imagine that. Um, and the other one is from the federal government. So this is from 2017. Um, and this, this found really strong support for 40 kilometre an hour limits in areas where lots of people walk. So people, people understand what lower limits mean and they can see the benefits of them. And having said all this, um, community support is a really worthwhile goal, but it's not a precondition for making the change. So in a lot of road safety initiatives, we've made the change and then people come along. And that's what we've seen in, um, in speed limit studies like one I mentioned earlier in the UK, they brought in the lower limit and then people saw the benefits and then they went, hey, this is a good thing, I like this in my street. Um, and in the past in, in Victoria and in Australia, you know, we've used the same sort of process, like things like compulsory seatbelts or um, speed cameras. You know, they're, they're not things people are necessarily saying, hey, we need this, but once they're in, um, people can see the benefits. So that's, I guess that's just the quick overview of the, the evidence and, and what do we know. Um, and then the second part of the presentation I just want to focus on, so what do we do? What, what does it mean? What does it, you know, what do we do with this information? So the first thing we'd like to see is a review of speed limits on arterial and collector roads, so particularly that, you know, 60 kilometres an hour and above. So most of our roads are, you know, the urban default urban speed limit's 50. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the local roads are 50 and then the arterials 60, 70, 80. You can see from this graph that crashes are occurring on roads with speeds of 50 and 60, which makes sense because they're the most common speed limits on our roads. That's where people are driving. Um, that's where people are walking as well, you know. That's where the stuff is that you want to get to. That's, that's where the bus stops are. That's where the parks are. That's where the schools are. And even though we have, you know, the 40K school zones, you still have to get to the school zone before you get the 40K benefit. So that, that sort of, that's intuitive. That makes sense. Um, but then if you look where people are dying, people who are walking, they're dying on the roads that have those high speed limits, which goes back to the earlier point, you know, of the human tolerance. There's only so much a human body can survive. So although our, um, you know, now if you end up in hospital, your treatment is much better, everything's much better, you're more likely to survive than you were once upon a time, but still the higher speed is just much, much higher risk. So that's why um, the arterials and collectors are something we'd really like to see looked at. Um, the second thing is we'd really like to see an urban default limit of 40 kilometres an hour. It's been 20 years since the 50 kilometre an hour was introduced, um, and in that time, you know, we've we've all we've learned a bit more, we've collected a bit more evidence, and there's been changes in attitudes and priorities since then, um, and we think it's time to to reassess. Um, so this graphic here is showing that when the default limit went from 60 to 50 in 2001, there were there were massive benefits, like safety benefits but also amenity benefits. You know, your local road became a bit of a nicer place to be. And not just it's not just for people walking. It's safer for, for everyone. Um, and we can make similar gains by moving to a 40K an hour speed limit. The other thing we'd like to see is for the state government guidelines to allow 30. Um, so the Victorian government is in charge of approving speed limits. And at the moment, the guidelines don't even include 30 as an option. So we'd like to see that as an option for 
for places like CBDs or major activity er- major activity areas, places where basically where there are a lot of people. And the other thing we'd like to see is for the guidelines to be um, updated to make shared zones easier to apply. So in places where people are walking and people are driving um, and they have to share the space using a 10 or 20k an hour limit um, and I guess making that a safer and more pleasant space to be. Um, it, at the moment in the guidelines to implement one of these, you guys probably know a lot of this, you might do this in your day-to-day work, um, but there's quite um, significant requirements that go along with it, like the signage and the threshold treatments, and there's a lot that the council has to do in addition to, to putting up the speed signs. Um, like one example I know of is Darabin, who have these two laneways. They're sort of made with cobblestones. They're narrow. You People walk along them to get to the house. They went through all the, the process of, you know, doing studies and collecting the evidence, the resources and time to do this application. Um, but when it was assessed, the response came back that, oh, the guidelines say to have a shared zone, you have to have high pedestrian volume. So, sorry, you can't have that. But it just doesn't make sense that in an area where people have to walk, where people are driving, that should be a shared zone. So that's something we'd like to see the guidelines updated to include basically anywhere where people are forced to share space or where the space is designed to be shared. Um, and we like to see some funding <laughs> to do all this. Um, the evidence says that, you know, if we go out and we just change the speed limit signs, let's say we change it from 50 to 40, 60 to 50, whatever we do, um, the street becomes safer. It does. Everyone doesn't necessarily obey it, but particularly the high-end speeding um, is reduced and that's that's the most dangerous thing. So um, there are benefits just, you know, just by changing the speed limit. But having said that, there's no doubt that self-explaining roads are even better, you know. When you're driving, you're like, well, oh, what is the speed limit? You, you can tell just from the way the road is. So we'd, we'd like to see, like, a regular ongoing fund so that councils and state agencies can rely on that and, and plan to make those physical changes to the environment. And the last thing I want to leave you with is, you know, if you you know the evidence, you you can see the benefits. <clears throat> what? How do you how do you communicate that with the community, with people you're talking with? Um, and Vic Health have this excellent. They've they've just been looking at this this excellent guide. It's called Values Based Messaging, and it's about um, it's about focus. The way I think of it is about focusing on the positives. So it's like, what do people like about safer speeds? So things like, you know, where it's like it's it's for everyone. People have options about how they want to travel. It gives people freedom, you know, think um, children. Um, if parents are more comfortable, then they have more freedom to, to use the, the, the space. Um, community connections, the quality. Like, like we know on streets with lower speed limits, uh, people are more likely to know their neighbours, so just it just makes it a more pleasant environment. So it's sort of sort of selling or describing that aspect of it. Um, and the role of government is to provide people with what they need. So we say things like, "We need more wider paths to walk. We need safe and convenient places to cross the road." So it's talking about, you know, um, h- how we can make a difference now, how we can make it you know, a nicer community. And just be very conscious of what facts you focus on. So historically we've measured the impacts on driving. So we've measured things like congestion levels, we've measured um, travel time, we've measured delays. And so that's the data we have and that shapes the discussion. Um, But where's the discussion on what people actually want like, do you measure your, your travel times? Oh, that, that was five seconds faster. Excellent. Like, people want pleasant local areas. They want options 
to drive or walk or ride. They want to feel safe when they're moving around. So it's focusing on that sort of those sort of benefits and um, communicating them and where we can measuring them as well. So we're sort of shifting the conversation. So um, that's it for the presentation.